Now, we have heard a lot about the SolarWinds breach. It was one of the largest and most sophisticated attacks in history. Microsoft President Brad Smith said, when we analyzed everything that we saw at Microsoft, we asked ourselves, how many engineers have probably worked on these attacks? And the answer we came to was, well, certainly more than a thousand. But not everyone got hit. There were those who were able to defend against this attack. Today, we're going to talk to a company whose security product defended against this attack. So stay tuned. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another Future Tech video podcast. The audio version of this podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and most of the others. Or you can find it at futr.buzzsprout.com. Today, we're talking with Sentinel-1. Their product fared better than most against the SolarWinds attack. To quote their site, Sentinel Labs, the research division of Sentinel-1, has confirmed that devices with Sentinel-1 agents deployed were excluded from the sunburst attack from an early stage, even before any communication with a malicious C2. Technical analysts have confirmed that Sunburst was unable to disable or bypass Sentinel-1 in any environment. And I'll just let that sink in for a second. Today we have with us Jared Phipps, Senior Vice President of Worldwide Sales and Engineering at Sentinel-1 to help us understand what it was that they did right and to tell us about their recent acquisition of log data management company, Scalar, and what that means for their business. Welcome, Jared. Thank you. Pleased to be here. <laughs> so, so Jared, thanks so much for coming. Tell me a little bit about Sentinel One. You know, like what's what's the founder's story? What was the problem that you know they saw in the market uh, and they wanted to solve? Uh, Tomer Weingarten, founder, is still here. He's still the CEO. It's um, one of the things I actually thought was really attractive coming here myself. But when and he's a serial entrepreneur. He's done businesses before. Um, but when he was Looking at starting Sentinel-1, he understood that the security space was problematic. Uh, he had a bit of a security background himself. And what he thought was an industry that was continually looking for new solutions, new solutions, just sort of a constant churn. Uh, he looked at models that really seemed manual, um, slow, really, really, you know, a lot of investigation intensive. And he was trying to figure out how can he you know, leverage AI on autonomous operations to transform an industry. And he looked at a few different things, but security is what he kept coming back to. Um, his, his thought process was doing something like, like you get with most big entrepreneurs and founders, right? He wanted to change the world, literally change the world. And he felt that doing so through the lens of security was, was open, uh, especially by leveraging AI. So, you know, it started off, um, in the early stages of the company focusing on Mac, believe it or not, like that's generally not where people start, but we, we started on Mac and Linux and then moved into Windows after that. But they, they spent a couple of years just really building, doing good R&D and building before they took a product commercial. So by the time they went commercial, they had Mac, they had Windows, they had Linux. And it was a, it was a true, I would say, evolution in terms of what it had done on endpoint security. You know, in, in our industry, endpoint security has been dominated by AV and EDR, right? AV was there to block everything you could block, and then EDR was there to capture and investigate everything. And what Tomer wanted to create and start was a business that unified all of that security under one umbrella. Yeah. And, and it just took AI on, on autonomous operations beyond just file inspection, but into everything that goes at runtime. And, and that's, you know, that's what he's done with Sentinel one. So that's, that's, that's our Genesis. So you guys fared very well against the solar winds breach, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, tell me a little bit about what, what, what you, you're seeing from the solar winds breach and, and, and what you guys um, saw, you know, from a, an attack perspective that you guys were able to um, address. Well, that one's, that one's interesting, right? It's it's got all the makings of nation state. I know a lot of people have come out and at, done attribution and tied it to Russia. I would agree with that entirely. When you're looking at a crime group versus a nation state, you're looking at a, a, a very different level of sophistication, right? And I've yeah. 
I started off my career in the Air Force. I've spent time on the defensive and operation and the offensive operations side of the house here. So I would say that when you're dealing with nation states, you go into a far more complex cycle uh, where supply chain risk management becomes a concern, um, where the the ability to select targets uh, from a desired set and then and then really focus on those targets in a in a bit more granular detail. Those are the hallmarks of it. Um, Cybercrime is very opportunistic. When, when something when something happens, they'll chase every one of them. So you know, the Solar Winds is is really the classic supply chain, right? If you can find software that runs on all of the different enterprises around the world, and you can inject your code into that software, that's the holy grail from an attack perspective. Yeah. And Solar Winds offers software that gives you visibility over the entire network, right? So it makes them the perfect candidate to be a target. And all they had to do was, uh, in this particular case, uh, remotely access and implant code, and then just watch and determine if they were able to identify the code that had been put into uh, the solar winds. You know, hindsight's twenty twenty. We can all look back at it now and say, here's what happened. But the reality is, while that's going on, it's very hard to capture. The supply chain is is very, very difficult um, to control. So I'm not going to get into the, into the nuances there. Yeah. Um, what I will say is that you know, after the solar winds breach comes out, after the artifacts are there, we can go through and we can reverse engineer um, the the actual malicious code, the sunburst attack. When we reverse engineer that, we can we can get a bit more of an understanding of how the attacker was working in those initial phases. Uh, and what we saw was actually pretty compelling. Um, when the when the solar winds software installs on a machine. It intentionally lays dormant for approximately two weeks, at a minimum 12 days. And then after that dormant period, it'll make out a beacon. So it'll do a command and control beacon out to avsvmcloud.com, which is a domain that they had registered and then they had affiliated it with various AWS regions, so east and west and various regions around. Now, the good news is because they're reaching out to a registered domain and we do have DNS uh, historical data, it gives us the ability in retrospect to go back and look for all of the initial command and control campaigns that have reached out to that domain name. So number one is we can tell every organization that had those C2 beacons um, contacting on there that we've, that we've looked at. Um, and then two, we actually have the payloads where we can reverse engineer it. And by going through in reverse engineering, yes, we can see what they're doing. And what they did is they started to encode different commands on that initial, that beacon out. So they're capturing information on the very first install beacon that they send out. They're capturing information around the security products that are installed on the machine. Mm -hmm. And they're capturing the state of those products, whether they're running or they've been able to be stopped. Right. Um, really, really pertinent information if you're thinking about this from a nation state perspective when you do a supply chain attack and you're expecting to have massive access your access is going to be larger than the actual targets that you want to execute against right and and so having the status of security products in those beacons back is pretty compelling and you can see in the source code, when you look at it, they do look for running services and processes. And, and there's actually some, some attempted um, anti-tamper and some attempted disabling unload events that they'll do. In the case of Sentinel-1, they they look for the, you know, you, they were looking for system and processes. They, they actually will eventually get down to looking at the driver level. And they were doing various techniques, you know, going into a registry and overriding the first uh, values to try to deal with the registry to, to unload agents. In this case, what we saw is they simply wrote code inside of the Sunburst malware that if they identified Sentinel-1 to simply exit. Mm. They would go back into a dormant status and then they would recheck after that randomized, again, another minimum 12 days, and they just come back and keep rechecking, hoping that Sentinel-1 has been uninstalled or the admins have done something with it, right? It's just a bit more opportunistic. Well, that's so, a nice... So that, was, that was the kind of the interesting case here is we didn't really have to stop the attack 
after all of that because it just wouldn't execute if Sentinel-1 was installed. Well, that's a nice endorsement from some Russian hackers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's um, you, you take it for what it is in this particular campaign. That's that's the decisions they made. Uh, yeah. We do have some some federal customers who've been targeted by that organization in the past. So while it's a hypothesis on my part, I don't think it's rampant speculation to think that, you know, they are aware of, of who we are and where we're running. Yeah. Um, you can generally go find endpoint agent code, just go look for virus total gold for different places. I don't think it'd be impossible to get access to Sentinel one binaries, but it would appear here that they they've had a little bit more recon, a little more, you know, time to try to focus on it. Um, we have a lot of anti tamper measures in place in the product that prevent the agent from being unloaded through the registry to the mm -hmm. methods that they were trying. And so it, it would appear, even though it's not, you know, something I can prove, it would appear that they had awareness that they, that their methods were not going to unload Sentinel one. And it would be better to simply avoid raising alarm bells. Uh, Hey, someone's tampering with your agent, right? That, that alone sends up an alarm bell. So they're trying to avoid sending the alarm bell. So if they see Sentinel One, they just exit. They didn't. They didn't want to try to mess with the with the anti tamper capabilities. That's my hypothesis. Yeah, I, that, that's really. I mean, it just goes to show you the level of sophistication of this attack. I mean, you know, when Microsoft's saying they 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 see the fingerprints of at least a thousand different, you know, hackers on this one, uh, working, you know, from a, a nation state. Um, that's a that's a significant foe, for sure. Yeah, I mean. Again, so I don't know that I would personally agree that they've had a thousand people building building on the code. Um, like like all things, uh, great things happen in smaller teams. Um, well, I, think, I think there's I think there's a military unit. I think there's yeah. a lot of design behind it. Um, I think there's some very good minds behind it. I just wouldn't put the number in the thousands. I'd probably put it in the hundreds. What what comes back is the notion of target selection. Yeah. Right. If you're in the military and you have available targets, you have to go through quality target selection. And that's what I think is probably more uh, aligned to the case. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've done some analysis just based on the, the C2 beacons that have come out. Um, you know, it's you would figure this is Russia. They're targeting government only about 20. I think it was 22 percent. If you round up um, of the initial C2 beacons come back that are even government related. Yeah. Um, technology like you know manufacturers of supersonic jet engines like it's not just tech it's very specific tech um they're showing up a lot of state and local governments which uh, which is interesting and then it was pretty heavy in healthcare and finance now finance is always targeted i mean yeah that, that's the thing about finance you're going to be hit by crime groups by by nation states you're going to be hit anything you can imagine uh, if it money flows, everybody wants to understand who, what, when, where, how, when it comes to money. So you're always a target if you're finance. Yeah. But healthcare by a nation state is not normal. You that that's just not normally what you would see. So one aspect of this is, hey, they went after Solar Winds. That's a very ubiquitous software. It's available. It's going to make a very large target set, and, and that's true, right? You're going to have tons of machines reporting in. Yeah. Um, what they chose to actually execute against what they selected off of that target list though is, is pretty telling. Um, and you know, you've got to make your decisions and your determinations of, of what to process and what order to process. Yeah. Look, we didn't, we didn't see this thing until December. It kicked off in March. It, the, the campaign executed. This wasn't like, we didn't have this miraculous find and stop. Like it, it was the, all the DNS activity, everything was telling down. They did a, they did a great job, well executed, and it was a, success, a successful campaign. And I don't think anybody can call it anything other than that. There's, yeah, there's definitely going to be some people in the U.S. government right now having some very hard conversations because oh, this, sure. this was a successful campaign. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, in, in that regard, you know, I, like you mentioned, this this was out there for a very long time. I mean, it's it's amazing that you know. People didn't catch it. I mean, you, like you said, hindsight's twenty twenty, right? But wh what were some of the things that they were doing that that made it so incredibly stealthy? Well, okay, so this is what Russia's always done. Uh, when they get into an organization, in, right? if you're a crime group, you're trying to drop in crypto miners or drop in ransomware. You're trying to figure out how to get paid on what you've done. If, yeah. if you're Russia, you're coming in, you're trying to avoid detection at all costs, and you're trying to discover information. 
right? So let's at the, at the end of the day, if you're a nation state, you're doing a cyber aggression for two primary reasons. I'm going to leave China outside this because they'll add a third, but one is denial, disruption of services, think power grids, think uh, equities and trading markets, things that you can cripple a country by taking down. Number two, which is the more prevalent use case is intelligence gathering. So machines create data and information meant to be consumed by people. So you want your people to consume what your, uh, what your enemies or adversaries out there uh, would have. So that's, that's why nation states hack each other, right? So when you're an organization like Russia and you're going in to do an attack like this, you're going to go after credentials. You're going to make yourself appear to be a legitimate user inside of the organization, and you're going to get access as much as you can to join conversations, to monitor conversations, to, to have access to data, to move around the environment. And to do so um, in today's day and age, you either need identity certificates or you need identity accounts. And that's what they focused on. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, uh, you know, although we didn't have any Sentinel-1 customers compromised, we, you know, we did open up and tell everybody, hey, if you want to send response teams, if you want to help to investigate some leads, we're happy to do so. We had some people who were concerned and we investigated. There were, there were dead ends everywhere. But following the national conversation, what's pretty clear is that the follow-on activity was using Cobalt Strike, mm. uh, which is something that Sentinel-1 does, does really, really well against. So there's, there's telltale signs to catch the follow-on activity once they get in um, that companies would probably have a you know, organizations, I should say, not companies, organizations, I think should have been able to detect some of that activity. Um, so that's a little bit disappointing that it, that it got as far as it did there. Um, but yeah, once they get in, once they get access to those creds, then everything else just looks like remote connections. Um, and it starts to look very legitimate. Um, and, and the case where you saw with FireEye, right? They got a little clumsy, not not excessively, but a little clumsy when they tried to, to do the two-factor authentication registration. They probably should have just kept focusing on certificates, that, that kind of tripped a wire. The difference is BuyerEye has people who are used to doing deep dive investigations. And when something weird pops up, they don't mind taking the time to delve in and do that investigation. Security companies will do that. Other organizations, they'll just write it off as a glitch or it's, oh, it's an anomaly or maybe somebody tried something, but whatever, they didn't get through because we didn't create the account and they deactivate it and then move on. They don't really have the resources to dig in and, and understand what's going on. That's the bigger concern because there's probably, and again, I, I don't know, I'm not part of the conversation, but I would have to suspect in retrospect, there's a whole bunch of red flags showing up that should have been watched that simply weren't. I mean, I, I would I would bet almost anything that that's the case right now inside the U.S. government. There's probably some really hard conversations around that right now. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think you touch on maybe one of the biggest problems in security today, right, is the fact that there's not enough qualified people to go around, right? Um, and you, know, when you look at red team, blue team, and you know, <laughs> and dividing people up, and you know how how that all plays out. I mean, it's 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 a it's a massive task to to not only just you know be very vigilant about this, but also to understand the types of things that are going on. And when you see something that looks a little unusual, being able to do that deep dive to figure things out. And I know, you know, one of the things that you mentioned in, in sort of the founder's story about Sentinel One was, you know, the the desire to apply, you know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, things like that to the process, I which I think is is kind of an important piece to this puzzle, right? Because if there's not enough people to go around, having some intelligence in the apps that can help people who may not have the level of sophistication, you know, that they may need, um, you know, derive answers and insights, I think is a really, you know, important piece, right? Uh, it's, it's tremendously important. I, I can give you, it's, it's interesting very early on, uh, the cybersecurity industry, and you can put myself on this list when I, when I was in the air force and people were talking about AI, I was very resistive to the idea that, um, a computer was going to offer any intelligence or analysis that the analyst we had couldn't handle. Um, but other industries have figured out how to let computers do some great things with it, like autopilot in the airline industry being one. Um, autonomous safety systems around transportation. I mean, just look for your vehicles, right? When I was in college, I drove a 1972 Datsun, right? A 280Z. It had no air conditioning. It had, you know, power brakes, power steering, like it was as basic of a car as you could get. Now, 
I told people I was driving it because it was a quote unquote driver's car. The reality was 500 bucks and that's what I could afford in college. Right? <laughs> Today, I drive a car that has lane departure warning, forward collision warning, auto braking, rear collision warning, crash avoidance, front airbags, side airbags. Like this car has so many systems. Now I'm still the driver. I still control the car. But when reaction times are where they are, it can start to react, you know, for me. It can tell me if I'm trying to transfer and someone's in a blind spot that someone's there. Like this is what you want from autonomous systems. If you go back to airplanes, right? Mm -hmm. You have all different types of safety systems that help pilots avoid midair collisions, things of this nature. The only time those bad crashes happen is when pilots ignore the systems telling them what they should be doing because they want to be smarter than the system. So let's talk in the cybersecurity world. Why do we need AI? Um, volume of data is number one and speed is number two. And, and by volume of data, uh, we, we actually have a buzz term in the industry now for this, which is alert fatigue. <laughs> yeah. um, I would tell you it's more like drowning in alerts. I, you know, unless you've lived it firsthand, like walk in and see your SIM with 10,000 alerts in them. And then you sit here and look at your sock and it's like, well, no, our tier one is going to analyze all the high and criticals and you watch them and they're opening up a screen and looking at some stuff and then they're deleting or they're, you know, like, there's nothing happening at that level that's incredibly valuable. Yeah. And then the hard stuff is supposed to be caught by your hunt teams in tier three or tier four, depending on the SOC that I've, that I've been working with. And these are for organizations that can afford the SOC and can build the SOC. Yeah. So yeah, I've, I've worked commercially primarily in the energy and financial sectors with some teams that truly have world-class security operations and they use orchestration and autonomous operations to enable them to scale. Okay. Everybody else, how do you get there? Yeah. You're not going to have the security budget to invest. And so I think it's fair. I mean, I, you know, I've come a long ways and obviously now with, with Sentinel one where we do AI and autonomous operations, behavioral analysis, we are taking what is really, really complex stuff. Um, but we're taking tier one responsibilities on ourselves and this is this is fantastic for organizations that can't afford the SOC. We literally have the teams to do that, right? We can be that solution. For other organizations that have the SOC, we can we can offload a lot of that tier one, and then we take all of our threat hunting and augment what they're doing. So it's like having this really really specific expert system. It's not just a software as a service, but it's a software as a service that has expert AI and behavior algorithms that will process anything faster runtime than, than a human ever will. And then it's augmented in the back end with, with an exceptionally good team um, to expand out your service. Like that's the right model for the industry today. And, and that's, that's what Tomer's vision was and his vision's proved correct. Right. So yeah. um, where we sit now, like we're, we're the fastest growing company in our space. It, it, it's amazing how fast we're, we're, we're coming along here. And and the adoption is because we're solving a real need, a real pain, um, taking some some pretty challenging problems on on behalf of our clients. Yeah, I I remember, um, you know, when you talk about alert fatigue, I, I remember back in the day um, at a, a, a global 500 company um, installed a security product. I won't mention the name of it, but um, and you know, a few weeks in, they were getting I think somewhere upwards of over 23,000 alerts a day. And, you know, obviously you can't, it's completely not actionable, right? And and, it, and it, after a while, they just stopped looking at it. And that's after spending, you know, millions of dollars to get everything in and installed and stuff like that. And, you know, just they didn't make the kind of investment to tweak and tune and, and do that, which is a full-time job in, a, in and of itself. Um, but it, it is amazing. And, and it, it, it continues to this day with a lot, of, a lot of organizations where there's just too much data coming at them, right? Crazy. Uh, yeah, it's insane. I mean, anybody who's had a home alarm system probably knows you, you get more false alarms in a year and you risk getting fined by the police than you do people breaking in your house. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. And and that's at the the most benign possible scale. Take that and throw that into an enterprise environment. 23,000 alerts, even if you can analyze all the highs and criticals, how accurate is that analysis going to be? Yeah, yeah. Like, it's just not going to be... I. 
it's that's not hypothesis, right? That's just what I've lived multiple yeah. times. It's, it's just not going to be accurate. So yeah. the, the other though, I think it's not just about the alerts. It's also about closing the cycle um, of the investigation. And this is where I think the autonomous side of Sentinel one kicks in a bit more. I think the industry as a whole, the security industry as a whole has come along and says, yeah, we can, we can use AI models to replace AV. Everybody's really comfortable with that. And we can use behavioral rules to trigger alerts that are higher fidelity. And everybody's come along and they're comfortable with that. What people are not recognizing is that we're, we're taking it a step further than that in that we're tracking everything into a single storyline, everything that occurs on endpoint to a single storyline. And we can not only stop the attack, we can surgically remove that attack from the endpoint. Mm. Um, and, and, and that means we're automating not only the detection and the deflection of the attack, but we're automating the recovery from the attack. And if I go back to where I was in, in 06 and 07 in the Air Force, where we were trying to define this vision, this grand vision of a self-healing endpoint that would allow us to operate through cyber attacks, um, Sentinel wants to deliver that. Mm. So for our customers, the endpoint, like we will attack, block, remediate, and attack that entire cycle, um, the entire investigation, remediation, triage cycle, that whole piece of it, can be done in 0.2 seconds. Yeah. Right. That, that's operating at the speed of compute. Can we do that for every single attack? No. But can we do that for the vast majority? Yes. And for the ones that take a little bit longer, yeah, like a long cycle for us is maybe 10 minutes. Mm. Right. And most of the industry is trying to get to benchmark standards that are that are multiples uh, above and beyond what we're delivering today. Yeah, and, and this is probably the most shocking thing because I'll get on with the Fortune 10 companies. I'll get on with the Fortune 100 companies. I'll explain to them what, are, what we're doing. We say, no, you're not. We go into POC and we do it. And they're like, wow, you are. Um, and, and that becomes a very different conversation. So yeah, we're doing it. We've been doing it. Um, we're doing it at scale. And we're going to continue to, to drive on excellence in this fashion because it's not about generating alerts. The security, security products and security vendors have got to get out of the mindset of generating alerts. It's about deflecting attacks and keeping intruders out of the environment and doing that as seamlessly and frictionlessly as possible for the users of that company. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's a, there's a million different security products out there right now. I mean, it's just a very disaggregated market. And I, and I think that, um, you know, there's so many companies, you know, some of which, you know, are more of a feature than a, a whole platform or a product even, you know, attack very specific areas of the, uh, of, of the security chain, right? You guys kind of play in the XDR space, which is, you know, kind of this evolving, you know, space of what fits into X, the definition of XDR. Where do you see your guy, you guys fitting into the whole security chain and, and how, how do you play in that, that whole mix? Well, the endpoint's interesting um, and compelling because you're at the point of data consumption. And, and so it's really your ultimate last line of defense. Mm -hmm. um, the EDR space has gone from being a sensor telemetry driven system to an autonomous attack deflection uh, position is where we have it now, mm -hmm. where we can do seamless remediation, et cetera. Um, Likewise, there's been an NDR concept for a while, network detection response. It started back with full PCAP vendors, and they went into metadata because PCAP was too, too hard to record. But again, storing on telemetry and then analyzing the events after the fact and then generating an alert to tell you what happened, that generally means you need to kick off an investigation. Um, and so we've, we've done integrations with NDR vendors um, and NDR, and a lot of that is driven through SIMS as well. So we have all of the standard integrations through SIMS. I think what's the vision of the XDR vision is that cross-domain uh, detection and response, right? Where you're not leaving NDR as a silo reporting into the SIM and EDR as a silo reporting into the SIM. You're now moving into cross-domain detection and attack. And I would like to, or detection response, and I would almost like to think of that um, as deflection in the Sentinel-1 methodology, meaning cross-domain, what automations can I drive? Cross-domain, what types of responses can I automate? Mm -hmm. and, and so we've done this um, with several different firewall vendors in, in the fabrics, like the Forda fabric, for example, 
where we can push intelligence back and forth between the two, but we can also now adjust in terms of an automated response. And this has typically been the domain of orchestration. And you had orchestration vendors building up and then you kind of see the SIM vendors sort of gobbling up orchestration. Uh, now, at the same time, data is a lot more prevalent when you start going XDR, when you start going cross domain, when you, when you no longer care that the data is coming from just your endpoint telemetry, instead you're pulling data from any network or any other security appliance, logging appliance, anything of that nature, allowing that data to come in. What we're doing here and why this is such a good fit for Sentinel One is our core competency is working with data. We are an AI behavioral analysis company. We do amazing things with data and we've proven it on the endpoint, which is probably the most difficult space to operate in at speed, at scale, with accuracy. Um, we've proven it there. Now we take that into the XDR space. So what are we going to do? And this is literally why we bought Scalar, um, which you kind of referred to earlier. But when we can start to move and, and operate at the speed of compute, on large data sets across fabrics, which include network and cloud and endpoint, the, the fabric simply becomes compute. The protected becomes the data and the protected becomes the user of that data. And, and that's really the vision we're driving for. Um, we will continue to invest very heavily um, on that data-driven vision as we go forward. Yeah, well, you, you, you brought up Scalar. Um... You know that that's quite a significant uh, acquisition. Could you talk a little bit about what Scalar does and what Scalar brings to the to the game here? Well, the the real key piece of what Scalar brings to the game is um, again when you're talking to Sentinel One. Hopefully, what you've gotten from me is um, the autonomous and the speed at which we're working. Right, we're right. not measuring things in hours or minutes. We measure things in seconds as much as possible. There are things we have to measure in minutes, but there may be even an hour every every occasionally. But we want to deflect and stop as much as possible. So when you start to looking at um, data, data aggregators, log aggregators, all that type of stuff that's out there, there's, there's a lot of them in the market. What's intriguing about Scalar and what I think was really compelling for us is that it can ingest unstructured data Okay, so we don't need to have a predefined nomenclature or uh, anything of that nature for the data set coming in. But more importantly is ingesting and allowing us to take operations at the speed of ingest on unstructured data. Mm. So while we think we're going to have gains um, from Scalar in many, many different aspects um, of operating a security program, we think that among the most important is it's going to align with our philosophy of deflection on autonomous operations. And we start to get pretty excited when we think about where we can go in the future. The, the future of compute is data. We, we all know that. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that are working on making it easy to stand up data infrastructure, um, making it easy to scale data infrastructure, and Sentinel One is going to do that, but we're going to also let you do that securely. Mm. So if you think about this, then it's not just about how Sentinel One is able to leverage uh, scalar technology for our security mission, but how we're going to be able to help people consume and leverage data securely in their environments. Because I've, I've really never met a CIO, CIO that said, I want to take on more security risk. I want to have more security burden on my team. They just want to be able to provide the business mission to their organizations. If we give them a secure path to data compute, that's that's pretty compelling. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting that um, I love to see acquisitions in this space because I, I think the the the, uh, the security market needs some consolidation. Some of these need to be wrapped up in you know broader suite of products brought together that are all integrated and in, you know kind of a single pane of glass sort of. Uh, a thing, and, and and you guys are an interesting case because you you guys have raised quite a bit of money. I mean, you, you I think you've raised almost upwards of seven hundred million dollars. You know, so I got to imagine you guys have a little bit of uh, you know acquisition power. You know, be even beyond uh, scalar. So you know, I know you can't talk about what the future ha you know holds in in acquisitions, but I got to imagine there's some really interesting opportunities out there for you to do some consolidation. 
Well, we'll, we'll always be looking for things that are strategic, um, that, that give us the ability to deliver um, the most value to our customers over time. Yeah. And when those types of opportunities present themselves, we'll definitely take advantage of them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that'll be interesting to see. So, so tell me a little bit about like what's next for, 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 um, for Sentinel one, what, what, what do you, where do you see things going for you guys? Well, we have to continue on the rapid growth path. That's what this industry demands yeah. uh, from a business perspective. Um, so scaling a business operation, um, doing this at the speed at which we've been doing this, and I think we've settled into um, a pretty polished approach of this uh, is really important. Um, we need to keep innovating. Um, so scaling the business is going to be one of the things we keep focused on. Innovation, uh, this is this is the heart and soul of 701. We can um, leverage some exceptional talent. We have core competencies, fundamental core competencies, and, and what we believe is world-class expertise in the in the realms of machine learning, artificial intelligence, behavioral analysis. Um, so, you know, how do we take that core competency and expand that into the XDR world? We've been doing that. Um, and we've been doing that actually for for some time now, but I think where we're heading on the XDR vision is providing a greater security blanket. And, and more importantly, we're not going to walk in and force an organization to rip and replace everything they have. Yeah. Um, and, and it's one of my pet peeves, right? Is yes, we're building an amazing platform and yes, we have a lot of stuff you can do on this platform, but you've already made some investments that are going to be strategic that you don't want to change. And you know, what I've, I had always wished a vendor would have told me when they walked in and said, I'm going to make your existing security investment better. Um, I've never had a vendor tell me that when I was on the buying side. But what we're focusing on now is taking the singularity platform that Sentinel One has and applying that into our customers' environments in a way that lets them get more value out of their existing security spend um, and, and putting that and really driving towards that XDR vision. So that's you know, that innovation pace that we maintain, uh, we will continue to innovate internally uh, very rapidly. Uh, and that's that's going to be a, a main focus of us. And then, you know, the probably the big elephant in the room that everybody wants to know is when is the IPO? And um, I, I can't tell you what the month exactly in it is. I can tell you that it's, that it's definitely the next phase. Um, I actually look at the IPO as the starting line. You know, yeah. I think we've all got the warm-ups done. We've been doing a lot of work and training to get to this point. Um, but we're all really, really excited to get on that starting line and really take off. Um, so we're going, and I think you kind of see a bit of direction just with the scalar acquisition alone yeah. of what we think is the, the strategy for the future. Um, but it's, it's going to be building and securing and providing a pretty comprehensive offering that appeals not just to a CISO, but to a CIO and to a board. Um, so you're going to see that, you know, that business side of the house, you'll see the IPO, um, you know, unless some crazy market conditions occur, um, you know, you, you can never predict the future. I, yeah, yeah <laughs> my senior year of college was September 11th. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a strange <laughs> world we live in these days. Nothing's yeah, entirely so predictable. You, you can never predict the future, but I would say that's definitely something that we're very, we're very focused on is uh, letting that IPO that's, that's getting us to the real starting line. And then, and that allows us to have the foundation to build uh, a very formidable long-term independent company um, for the, for decades to come. That's, that's the focus. That's the goal. So Jared, uh, I keep hearing from so many people, it's hard to find really good security people. And uh, I have found that to be true for us as well. So where are they? Like, how do we, where, where do we go to find the folks that actually have the, not the, just the theoretical expertise, but the practical expertise? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, you can find, I, I would say you can find people anywhere. And that's, that's not the answer you want to hear. But I'll, I'll tell you what it's really easy to find are people that understand the buzzwords and they know how to sling the buzzwords and they can talk about the buzzwords. Right? <laughs> um, people that understand how to be a practitioner is a bit more difficult. Yeah. There's training programs and they get people leveled up to be a tier one analyst. Um, I, th I think we can figure out how to get tier one analysts and you can go find them 
at any of the larger organizations where they run their socks and, you know, they pay them 65,000 a year and it's pretty easy for a company to come in, hire them into a senior role, give them 95,000, move, move them somewhere across the country. So yeah, you can find a lot of those in San Antonio around the AFSER. You can find them in different cities around the DOD certs and the federal certs. And then you can find them around the larger organizations, um, especially the ones based in California. People are People are definitely wanting, it's very difficult to live on 85K a year um, in the Bay Area. So people in those certs out there uh, or those socks for those organizations out there. Um, so that, that's where you find the tier ones. I think the challenge, and I think really what the question that you're getting to is, how do you find the person that would, would have recognized that two-factor authentication registration as not an anomaly, but it's a security that you go dig into? That's harder, right? Because now you start to delve, you start to touch into forensics, but really what you're looking there is in incident responders. Um, where do you find the people that can drive a really, really good security program? Um, you, you find them in the incident response world, people that have um, come out of college, they started working for an auditor and they got moved into um, the, the IR teams or people who were sysadmins and they got kind of sucked up into IR teams who've been doing incident response engagements and then been dabbling in forensics and memory analysis and they understand that world, um, that's a pretty good place to recruit from. There's actually a lot of companies out there that do that work. Um, and, you know, that's, that's where the talent gets a bit more expensive. Can we build those? Can we grow those? Um, I, I do see some corporations doing that, but I see the majority of that growth even today uh, being done inside of, of military. So Air Force OSI, um, they do some great cyber crime investigation stuff. The Any of the operations down in the AF cyber teams, you know, you have programmatics, you have different types of skill sets down there, but you do have a lot of core operators, a lot of core pen testing and red teamers. And then even the large, the big five, um, have some decent programs um, that can get you some, some basic skill sets. The problem is that pipeline isn't big enough. Yeah. And the problem is you go look at the universities who are doing cyber training and it's far more programmatic, right? Like as a comp sci student, I had a class on compilers. I hated that class. I have nightmares of that class to this day, right? I'm, I'm not a software coder because I figured out in college that I didn't want to be a comp sci person. But I, I did that because I had to write a compiler. I did that because I had to write uh, at C level and Perl and then Java and all these different programs and write different applications. You go through a cybersecurity program, are you doing memory forensics? Are you doing full disk acquisitions? Are you trying to do these things remotely? No, you're, you're kind of learning some tools, some skills, but it's still a little too programmatic, a little too high level. Um, things that are still a topic that you cover over a module, like memory forensics, should be a course or two, and they should be just as painful as compilers was maybe. Um, so, so that's a challenging set, right? And it's, yeah. it's find the people that have enough of the understanding of coding and forensics and back and find that right mix together is what makes it challenging. So at the end of the day, the problem is we don't have the right educational pipeline to scale and put out the volume of security analysts that are needed. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's still reliant on a lot of self help, self teach, self learn. Yeah. or proper exposure in the limited places you get. And that's the challenge. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah. I think, you know, schools have a, have a big challenge in that because to develop a curriculum is hard. And when you're dealing with an industry that's moving at the pace that security is and the level of change that happens in, the, in that, that world, I don't know how you get around, you know, finding people who are very self-motivated to do that learning, right? <laughs> I, I don't yeah. know. I, I, I think it comes down to some expectations and to raising the bar a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, the two parallels I would give you here, and obviously an Air Force guy, I'm going to go to aviation. Aviation is a pretty innovative in industry. You can go get a degree in aeronautical engineering, and you will have some really challenging courses, and you'll have a high, a high washout rate, but you'll also have a good job when you're done. And you're going to be picked up by a Boeing or, or a, a Lockheed or someone big, and you're going to apply all of those math and physics models right away, right out of the gate. You're going to learn some skills and then you're going to have a very defined specialization within that industry. And there's a fit for you. Yeah. The difference is Boeing builds airplanes. They sell them and they make money on it. Now you do this as a cybersecurity person. Let's say you became one of the best, you know, uh, forensics analysis uh, analysts out there. Companies don't make money hiring a forensic analyst. 
right? So this goes back to the core problem that cybersecurity is risk deference. It's not revenue generating. Yeah. And so yeah. I can bash on the industry a little bit from the educational side of the house saying we're not ramping up and preparing people properly. But unless you're a cybersecurity vendor, you're, you're in a world of cost avoidance, cost deflection. Um, so there needs to be a change in the mindset. And, and if you look at a CISO as a business, uh, a, a member of the executive council as a business member, they're out there to try to figure out how to maximize revenue. Yeah. And, you know, ransomware is probably the thing that has shifted a lot of board members that I talk to and a lot of CIOs that I talk to into understanding the financial penalties of this. Outside of that, people just didn't care. Like, okay, so Russia hacked us and they got a couple of things maybe, and yeah, this is bad and we'll, we'll spend a couple more million, but they're not investing in it as if it's the same thing as the next product line is going to make them new revenue. Yeah. They're not hiring the best talent so they can outcompete their competitors to produce the best revenue. Yeah. And, and that's one of the challenges. Um, maybe the medical industry is a bit closer of a parallel where you have a lot of complex systems, you have a lot of data that needs to be analyzed and you wind up with a lot of specialties. The difference there though is as a patient, you will go between specialists. You don't own them all, right? Right. And, and I think that's where the industry is going to trend closer towards. Companies are going to want to, to look to people like Sentinel One and say, okay, you've got the MDR, you've got the endpoint, I want these services. I want to pick up all these components of your platform and I want you to simply provide that service to this company. And I think that's the direction that the industry is going. And will continue to go because that's more aligned with cost avoidance than it is with revenue generation. Yeah. And and if we wanted to get into a world where there was enough cybersecurity talent for every company to go hire and use them, they would have to be making money on the cybersecurity versus just avoiding losing it. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I think I think you're spot on with that. And I think that, you know, you talk about some of the 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 key security folks that you have in your organization that can, you know, reach out and help your customers. I think that's kind of a really, you know, the the, the model that's going to work in, in this world because there's going to be concentrations of these really talented people. And I think, you know, companies are going to have to reach out to other organizations to get that talent to help them. Well, yeah, and you better be able to keep it when you find it. Yeah. Like this, this is one of the things that I, I think is underestimated is when you've built a program and it generates a ton of data and a ton of alerts and a ton of noise – nobody in their right mind wants to be a tier one forever. <laughs> yeah. That's like saying you want to work in, in the help desk forever. Like, yeah. no, there's everybody has that grind job early on in their career and you do it and you work your tail off through that grind. And that's what tier one is in cybersecurity. If you hire really, really competent people and then you expose them at all to tier one grind repeatedly, they're going to go work for the place that has better tools, better processes that exposes them to less mind numbing work. Yeah. Um, so I think I fully, fully expect industry to hold me accountable as a vendor to offload the mind numbing stuff. Yeah. And the way we're going to offload it is to AI and autonomy. Well, and I think another, you know, we had the CEO of Arctic Wolf on um, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that he said is that, you know, so many of these security people that go into these organizations and half the time they're building boxes and, you know, doing server admin and stuff like that. And that's not what a security person signs up for. And that's why he's like, I have an advantage to hire people because they do security work 100 percent of the time rather than, you know, like doing crappy busy work that the organization needs them to do. And, you know, I, I, that's why I think, you know, like organizations like yours are going to have the advantage in that case because it's, it's a more compelling environment to be in you know, at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean. Look, if you're a really good professional at what you do and you think you're a world-class professional, then you probably want to work at a company who has world-class tools yeah, and, and lets you challenge and, and you challenge yourself with really complex problems. And if, if you can't give your top-end security members that type of experience, then yeah, they're going to go somewhere else. Yeah. Jared, I got to say, thanks so much for coming on. I think... Um, you know, you, you brought some really interesting insights that, uh, you know, we haven't really heard uh, before, I think, in, in, regarding the, the solar winds conversation. So I think that's um, that's really great information for folks. And I, I, I wish you guys the best of luck and hopefully you continue your success and you have a 
phenomenal IPO and you can uh, you know continue your consolidation of the market. Yeah, well, we're hoping to build something for a long time, so I'm excited. Thank, thanks again uh, for taking the time to, to talk to me today. It was, it was fun. Yeah, no, it was definitely fun. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Take care. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please click the like button. Hit that subscribe button because that's super important for the channel. And if you want to get notified when I post new content, click on that bell icon and you will get notifications. And I will see you in the next video.